This is the first part of gastrointestinal anatomy. We start with the abdominal wall. Now regions of the abdomen. The abdomen is divided into nine equal quadrants by two horizontal and two vertical lines. The horizontal ones are the transpyloric and the transtubercular plane. And in the vertical region, we have the midclavicular and the mid inguinal plane. This gives rise to nine equal quadrants here. The right and left hypochondriac. In between, we have the epigastric. The right and left lumbar in the middle. In between, we have the umbilical. And right and left iliac. And in between, we have the hypogastric. This also gives rise to four different quadrants here. For the ease of study, which is the, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, and the left lower quadrant. Now the purpose of such a division is basically to understand the localization of pain or different viscera's which are involved during the various pathologies. So we'll move on to the layers of abdomen. Now abdomen is divided into nine layers. There's skin in the outside. Then we have the superficial fascia which has two parts, the fatty layer and the membranous layer. Then we have three different muscles, the external oblique, the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis, followed by the peritoneal cavity. Then we have the visceral peritoneum. And lastly, in the inside, we have the viscera. Also, the nerve supply of abdomen is T7 to L1. So this is the nerve supply of abdomen. To give you a brief idea, at T7, we have the epigastrium and at L1, we have the anterior superior iliac spine and somewhere in between this at T10 we have the umbilical region. So this is the nerve supply. We'll move ahead. Coming to the muscles of the abdomen. Here we have the external and the internal obliques which are spread laterally and in the center we have the aponeurosis of oblique muscles. So these external and internal obliques they are spread laterally here and here also. And in the center, we have the aponeurosis of these oblique muscles and this is known as the rectus sheath. Rectus sheath. So this basically has a rectus sheath. And in the center, we also have another muscle apart from the oblique, which is the fourth muscle. Sometimes we have in the lower part of this rectus abdominis muscle, we have a very small muscle, which is the pyramidalis, which is supposed to be the fifth muscle. So... I hope the diagram is clear. We have the coastal margins here, the inguinal ligament, and then we have the obliques and the center, the rectus sheath, and the rectus abdominis and pyramidalis here. Let's move ahead and talk about the, each of these muscles in detail. We start with external oblique muscle. So external oblique muscle extends downwards, forwards, and medially. Coming to the origin, we have this originating from coastal cartilage and the fifth to twelfth rib. The insertion is in the ziphoid process. The outer lip of iliac crest, pubic crest, pubic tubercle, linea alba, inguinal ligament, and the anterior superior iliac spine. The nerve supply of external oblique muscle is T7 to T11 and T12. So basically the nerve supply is T7 to T12. Now we'll be talking about ligaments which are there in relation to the external oblique muscle. So here we have the anterior superior iliac spine and here we have the pubic tubercle. Now the external oblique is, as we have seen, that it moves from here to here and towards the anterior superior iliac spine. Now from anterior superior iliac spine, it goes to the pubic tubercle and it kind of goes from inside and gets upturned. So this upturning of anterior superior iliac spine towards the pubic tubercle give rise to a ligament which is known as the inguinal ligament. Inguinal ligament. So inguinal ligament is nothing but the, the upturn formation in the course of external oblique muscle. Now this inguinal ligament is also known as the Poppard's ligament. So inguinal ligament and Poppard's ligament are the same and they are formed by upturnation of external oblique muscle. Now there are few extensions which are seen from the inguinal ligament. One of them is that if this upturnation that is this inguinal ligament goes towards the midline here, this will give rise to what is known as the linea alba. Linea alba. And if this same inguinal ligament, if this goes backwards, this inguinal ligament will form the lacunar ligament. Lacunar ligament. And if this lacun lacunar ligament, it goes further backwards, like here, 
So this further backwards will give rise to the Cooper's ligament. Cooper's ligament. Another name for Cooper's ligament is the pectineal ligament. Pectineal ligament. So external oblique muscle from ASIS to the pubic tubercle giving rise to what is known as the inguinal ligament or the Popart's ligament. This inguinal ligament if it goes to the midline will give rise to linea alba. If it goes backwards this will give rise to lacunar ligament and this lacunar ligament if it goes further proximally will give rise to Cooper's or the pectineal ligament. Next we will move on to the internal oblique muscles. The internal oblique muscle basically lies beneath the external oblique and just above the transversus abdominis. So we have the external oblique muscle here and the transversus abdominis here and in between we have the internal oblique muscle. The origin is the inguinal ligament and iliac crest and the lambosacral fascia. The insertion is in the linea alba, pectineal line of pubis and the ribs, the 10th to 12th ribs. Coming to the nerve supply, the nerve supply is T7 to T11, T12 and the L1. So the nerve supply is T7 to L1 in case of internal oblique muscles. We will move ahead. Now coming to the transversus abdominis muscle. This transversus abdominis muscle, as I have already told you, it lies deep to the internal oblique muscle. The origin is in the iliac crest, the inguinal ligament, thoracolumbar fascia and the 7th to 12th coastal cartilage. The insertion is in the xiphoid process, linea alba, pubic crest and the pectin pubis. The nerve supply is T6 to T11, T12 and L1. So we have T6 to L1 as the nerve supply of transversus abdominis muscle. Moving ahead, we'll talk about rectus sheath. It is basically a covering of the rectus abdominis muscle. If you remember the diagram I had shown you, it was something like this. And here we had these obliques. And in the center we had what was the rectus abdominis muscle. And I told you that these obliques, they, they formed an aponeurosis. These internal external obliques, they form an aponeurosis and form the rectus sheath. So rectus sheath is basically formed by the aponeurosis of internal and external oblique and the transversus abdominis muscle. So contents of rectus sheath, if we see the inside, we will have the rectus abdominis and some, sometimes we will have this small muscle, which is the fifth muscle as I already told you, the pyramidalis. So we will have rectus abdominis and pyramidalis muscle as the contents of rectus sheath. Now a little about rectus abdominis muscle. This is also known as the abdominal muscle or the abs. So as the name suggests, you will all be knowing that this muscle is used in exercise and strengthening of this improves the performance in sports. This muscle is also used during cuffing. It is also used during our bowel movements and also during childbirth. So we move ahead and now something more about rectus sheath. This rectus sheath has two parts, the anterior part and the posterior part. The anterior part has the external oblique muscle and the anterior lamina of internal oblique. And the posterior part has posterior lamina of internal oblique muscle, the transversus abdominis and the fascia transversalis. Now what happens is that if this is the umbilicus, this is umbilicus and this somewhere here we have the pubic symphysis. So somewhere between the pubic symphysis and the umbilicus what we see is that there is an aponeurosis of these three, the internal oblique muscle, the transversus abdominis and the external oblique muscle occurs. So let's imagine that here we have the aponeurosis. Now how will the aponeurosis happen is that these two muscles, the posterior lamina of internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis, they move from posterior to anterior. So they move here from posterior towards the anterior part, they'll move. So Maybe somewhere here, we'll see that we already have the external oblique muscle anteriorly and from the posterior part, the posterior lamina will come and merge with the anterior lamina of internal oblique muscle and we'll have this also and then the transversus abdominis also. This aponeurosis of these three occurs here. So if the aponeurosis of these three occurs here, this line is known as the arcuate line. 
arc weight line and this arc weight line is also known as linear semicircularis I write or linear semicircularis or it is also known as line of Douglas Douglas okay so eponeurosis of external oblique internal oblique and transversus abdominis will give rise to arc weight line linear semicircularis or the line of Douglas now coming to the inguinal part which is the last part of this video the inguinal canal lies on the middle half of the inguinal ligament it is about 8 cm in length so length is around 8 cm and now how this inguinal canal is basically formed is that the, if this is the fascia transversalis and we have a deep inguinal ring here and this is the external oblique muscle and we have a superficial inguinal ring here so in between this deep and superficial inguinal ring the connection of this leads to the formation of the inguinal canal. Now this inguinal canal, if the deep inguinal ring is the entry point, the superficial inguinal ring is the exit point. Now what is entry and exit is basically, this is the entry and exit of the gonads which occurs during the development. So that de during development the gonads for their proper development they come out from the abdominal cavity and then they take this route that is they enter through deep inguinal ring and they exit to the superficial inguinal ring and this leads to the formation of the inguinal canal in, the, in this cavity if it's a female it will go to the labia majora okay and if it's a male this is for females and if it's a male it will go to the scrotum so this sums up the video hope you enjoyed it and learned from it do not forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you so much.